Meanwhile, the Soviet Union was still planning the free return trajectory around the moon, and after that, they're going to build a big booster like we had. But before that, our intelligence knew that they had launched that first stage with a Soyuz that not that round and orbital ball. So it had two people in there for five or six days. And that was much like to say the Soviets had been to the moon. And then we were going to have the big booster, the N1, which weighed more than the 7 5. And my good friend Alexei Lyonov, he was the one who had been chosen to go on that. He was there to watch those N1s blow up time after time. The first one got about 12,000 feet. One of the pipes broke and caught fire. The second one, got up to about three to five hundred feet above the battery. And one of the oxidizer boats, it was 30 engines sold about it, and it actually exploded. And it fell back. That was the biggest non-nuclear man-made explosion in the history of mankind. Two months later, Apollo 9 launched with two spacecraft, the normal Apollo command module and the new lunar module they named Spider. It was the first checkout of that ungainly machine in Earth orbit. So the LIM is really the taxi that provides the transportation between the orbiting command module and the lunar surface. The lunar module flew again in Apollo 10, this time to the moon in a full dress rehearsal of a landing attempt. And so I flew the first lunar module out there with Gene Sun. There's my lunar module pilot, John Young is my command module pilot. But our job, Sir and I, was to go down about 10 miles above the moon and try to pick out potential <coughs> landing sites on the moon for the next mission mission that might make it. I felt like I had to pick up my feet to keep, keep from them. dragging my, my heels on the top of those mountains. When you move that fast across the surface and you're that close, it's an overpowering experience. At one time, actually, Apollo 10 was in line to be the first landing, and Tom Stafford could have been the first man on the moon, and that would have been perfectly fine, and I would have been the second, and that would have been perfectly fine. But the feeling was that we just didn't know enough to do that. So we took the next uh, thing, and I was happy to be on the next mission. It just never would have occurred to me to uh, want it to have been any place else than where I was on Apollo 10. There was no person really selected be the first one on the moon. I had 10, Neil had 11, Conrad had 12. We said, somebody will land. I think that we felt that the missions 9 and 10 adequately demonstrated the lunar module's capabilities. That we really, deep down inside, felt that we could make it. We could have very good possibility of making it on the first try. I, I was asked by bosses, do you think you and your guys are ready. And I have to say, well, you know, it'd be nice to have another month, but we were in a race here, and uh, we had to take the opportunity we had it, and I had to say, we're ready. We are ready to go. We just, we were there at the right time. Uh, you know, Neil Armstrong born in 1930, Buzz Aldrin 1930, Mike Collins 1930, you don't call that lucky? I, I loved them both, but uh, what I would almost call freakish circumstances kept us from being as close as some of the crews. Neil and Buzz would be off in Bethpage, uh, Long Island, worrying about Grumman putting the lem together. I'd be in Downey, California, worrying about the command model. Due to a whole set of circumstances, uh, we didn't have that uh, bonding experience. We all came together about six months before the flight. You know, there was some small fuss, if I remember correctly, before the flight about who went first, but it seemed to me that Neil Armstrong should have gone first because of his uh, experience out at Edwards as a test pilot for NASA. He was almost in a class by himself, so that was what we considered the single most important yardstick, if you will. And also, I thought, from a personality point, he was a superb choice. Our launch day finally arrived. We took the elevator up the gantry with a 360 foot tall Saturn V rocket stood magnificently as the countdown progressed. Due to the seating order, I was the last 
to enter the spacecraft. So I stood two flights down alone on the gantry and I could see the sunrise over the waves of Cocoa Beach. Dawn at the Cape on the 16th of July, 1969. In the minds of many was the emerging concept of a new era for mankind on planet Earth. The curtain was going up on what was truly the greatest show on Earth before the largest single audience ever assembled. 12, 11, 10, 9, ignition sequence starts. 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0, all engine car. Liftoff, we have a liftoff, 32 minutes past the hour. So then we fired the third stage engine and it accelerated us to 25,000 miles an hour on the trajectory bound to the moon. Going to the moon, I always liken it to a long, complex daisy chain, a lot of lengths, fragile. You break one length, the rest of them don't matter a lot. On the eight day round trip journey, the three of us lived in the space capsule. I thought uh, we had a 90% chance of getting back safely to Earth on that flight, but only a 50-50 chance of making a successful landing on the first attempt. There's so many unknowns in that descending from lunar orbit down to the surface that had not been demonstrated yet by testing and uh, it was a big chance that some, we didn't understand something in there properly and we had to abort and, and come back to Earth without landing. On day three, we fired the engine to slow us down and the moon's gravity captured us into orbit. Neil and I entered the lunar craft named Eagle and separated from the command module Columbia where Mike Collins remained. Roger, Eagle, Sun Dot. Roger, how does it look? The Eagle has wings. And so we piloted our spacecraft, Eagle, to the Sea of Tranquility, the most complicated and critical aspect of the entire mission, landing. OK, all flight controllers, go, no, go for landing. Retro, go, Righto. go, guys, go, control, go, right now, go, surgeon, go. Eagle, Houston here, go for landing. In the middle of the descent, our computer did complain at us that it was having a problem. We asked mission control, or it was an overload problem in the computer, but the central part of the computer that was doing our calculations of, of our position and our navigation was working properly, and that was good news. So we continued on toward the landing site, but then the computer showed us where it intended to land, and that was on the side of a uh, large crater with very steep slopes covered with very large boulders. Not a good place to land at all. So I took over manually and flew it like a helicopter, got into a smoother area with not so many rocks, found a level area, and was able to get it down there safely before we ran out of fuel. Four forwards, just into the right level. 
When we actually shut the engines down on the moon surface, we had only 17 seconds of fuel remaining. We were that close. But you could not imagine anything more desolate than what we saw in front of us. Not a sign of life anywhere, nothing growing, just rolling little craters. There was no atmosphere, total blackness beyond the sunlit terrain. Probably hadn't changed in a hundred thousand years, and yet that's where we were. To us, the important thing was getting that machine on the ground safely. Getting down on the, on the surface didn't seem like much of a big deal to us. Okay, Neil, we can see you coming down the ladder now. I'm uh, at the foot of the ladder. The lamb footbeds are only uh, depressed in the surface about one or two inches, uh, although the surface appears to be very, very fine-grained as you get close to it. It's almost like a powder. I'm going to step off the lamb now. My job was get the flag there. I was less concerned about whether that was the right artifact to place. I'd let other wiser minds than mine uh, make those kind of decisions, and I, I had no problem with it. That salute was the proudest moment in my life as a military person. We recognized that we wouldn't have been there if it hadn't been for our competitors in the Soviet Union was actually the competition that made both of our programs able to do the things that they achieved. And so we recognized that by putting some medallions for our fallen comrades on both sides who uh, had not lived to see the event. That was a tender moment, but it was only instantaneous because there was work to do. We spent a total of Two and a half hours out on the surface, collecting rocks, setting up experiments, taking a few pictures. For thousands of years, the moon has made her impression upon men and planet Earth. Now man, from planet Earth, has made his impression on the moon. How must those men feel? What must they think as they reflect upon what we have called so technically, so unemotionally, their extravehicular activity. Perhaps we may never know exactly how they felt as they leaped about on the desolate magnificence of the lunar landscape. But remember what we can do if we can just imagine. When he talked about Americans around the world where foreigners were coming up to them in different capitals and saying, we did it, and congratulating Americans, but it was we did it. And they were talking about themselves along with us, the way they viewed this whole thing. I think for the first time, maybe, we had the people of the whole world with a sense of 
But this was a step that nobody had ever done before. And it was something that meant a lot to people all over the world. Our Earth is a bit over four billion years old, and in the first four billion, in cosmic terms, not much happened. Then, in 1968, we left. Apollo 8 left. It exceeded escape velocity, and gravity could no longer keep us pinned down here on the surface. The next year, Apollo 11 not only left, but arrived. Neither went very far or did very much, but as Ben Franklin once asked, what use is a newborn baby? I think Apollo was a dividing line, putting Earth, for better or for worse, into a new category, into the big leagues of planets. To me, that is what is the most significant thing about Apollo. Apollo 11, Houston, uh, you're still looking mighty fine here. Uh, you're clear for landing. Now we appreciate that, Rodney. Got you here, down the line. The sense of fulfillment, not only personal satisfaction, but basically the satisfaction that as a nation we had demonstrated that what we can dream, if we will give our best, we can do. We can live up to the truth. It was a great personal honor to walk on the moon, but as Neil once observed, there are still places to go beyond belief. From the Wright brothers and Kitty Hawk to Tranquility Base was 66 years. From Tranquility Base, 66 years in the future takes us to 2035. I believe we deserve to do a little bit more than footprints on the moon. Apollo 11 is a symbol of what a great nation and a great people can do if we work hard, work together, and have strong leaders with vision, realizing the dream of exploration by way of determination. Can you believe it? Can you realize that we, that you and I, that all of us, have actually begun the exploration of another world? We have taken the first historic step into our solar system. And with your continued support, I will see you back in orbit with that new space station for which we will all ride on a reusable launch vehicle, and maybe one day we'll have a man on Mars. Thank you. The space race faded away. It was the ultimate peaceful competition, USA versus USSR. I'll not assert that it was a diversion which prevented a war. Nevertheless, it was a diversion. It was intense. It did allow both sides to take the high road with the objectives of science and learning and exploration. Russians announced they had no interest in the moon. They were focusing on an Earth orbiting manned laboratory. In October, Soyuz 6, 7, and 8, with seven cosmonauts aboard, flew simultaneously. And in November, Apollo 12 made the second successful landing on the moon. And that may have been a small one for Neil, but that's along with Ruby.